He's Asian. I'm Filipino. I'm not one of y'all. I'm not one of y'all. You think I give a shit about you? Let's talk about how you call Filipinos dirty. I'm glad you're watching. This video is a continuation of the previous video I made on the diaspora war within the Asian people in America. So, right now, as I was scrolling down, I realized that there's another related topic to this, which could be explaining the reason for the diaspora war. Could be. I've said. Could be. And this is the East asian privileges so they are asian living in america from different places in the world asian you know it's comprised of so many countries and this is asian tends to be privileged than the rest of asian what in america about, what are you all you think give a shit about you let's talk about how you call filipinos dirty so could it be that the white privilege uh is unmatched or let me say, if you're given a privilege and you are not an American, could it be just a pinch of privilege from what the white people get? So I don't know what you think about this. Tell me why every time I post something about Southeast Asians and East Asians, I get East Asians in my comments saying, oh, but we're both Asian or why are you hating on another Asian? Then you all make it very clear that Southeast Asians and all different kind of Asians are very different from East Asians because y'all think you're at the top of the hierarchy. Now all of a sudden it's a kuna matata because y'all are getting exposed. Now you want to be Asian together. Mm -mm, no, I'm Southeast Asian. I'm Filipino. I'm not one of y'all. I'm not one of y'all. You think I give a shit about you? Let's talk about how you call Filipinos dirty. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about the East Asian Privileges course. Yeah, I think we should. Namely, that there is quite a bit of difference between what your definition of privilege is and the definition of privilege many, many other people hold. Namely, that I think you misunderstand the idea that privilege is not diametrically opposed to oppression. We can acknowledge that East Asians are viewed as more legitimate in their Asian identities, that East Asian activists have an easier time gaining social capital for their activism, and that East Asian movements are much more likely to gain coverage than others, while still acknowledging that we are still oppressed. Because while you say that you don't want to compare East Asian privilege to something like white privilege or male privilege, I think it's important to note that privilege can be relative. For example, being a lighter skinned person of color in a society that favors lighter skin does not mean you are not oppressed as a person of color. It simply means that compared to darker skinned members of your race, as a whole, lighter skinned people possess certain societal advantages compared to them. In America, the same holds true in certain contexts for East Asians in comparison to other Asian groups. Still oppressed though! Growing up half Filipino and half Chinese, I definitely witnessed this firsthand when it came to like my Chinese side of the family talking about my family because we were like mixed both southeast asian and east asian but we looked more like filipino um they would always like comment on our skin tone they would always tell us that we were like pacific islanders that we weren't real asians or that we like they would make fun of us for not speaking chinese which is so dumb I feel like they thought that they were better than us because like they spoke chinese or they were like way lighter than us or some shit like that which was so ridiculous um but i feel like people think that all asians just think of each other as the same when that is definitely not the case i feel like a lot of east asians think that they are above other asians which is really weird why is being japanese special on her and bad on me Okay, this is a really good point and I kind of want to talk about it more. If you haven't seen the original creator's video, she's basically comparing perceptions of three East Asian countries being Japan, Korea, and China. Essentially, Korea and Japan are being romanticized a lot, especially here on TikTok, while China is just kind of full of memes of like social credit and also the CCP. And I think this brings up the question of why our perception of China is so different from its East Asian neighbors. I think a term pretty crucial to this discussion is the idea of soft power and this basically is the ability of a country to influence another country without using economic or military might. There are a lot of things which make up soft power but one of the things is cultural attractiveness. This is why when you think of Korea a lot of the times you'll be thinking of K-pop and this is why when you think of Japan a lot of the times you think about anime but what does China really bring to the table here? The question to ask here is why China has a soft power deficiency and hint, it's not because they don't have anything to share. There's something she's just said that I want to build upon. So East Asian American parents, you know, from China, Korea and Japan, they give their children Americanized name for them to fit in in the culture. So could it be that for you to be privileged in a certain society, let me say in America particularly, you have to give up on your culture maybe and fit in 
and look like them for you to be like them and for you to like be part of them can't you be different still maintain your culture still maintain your name and still gain the same privileges unlike those who are south asian american who don't give their children this americanized name like <laughs> such as indians you know they give their children names like uh vesha and vanehi so you can add to the list so could that be the reason as well my birkin don't forget to leave your thoughts kindly another birkin but what makes these two birkins different and what small feature about them divides the Hermes collector community. Let's talk about it. of us, when our parents came from East Asian countries, China, Korea, Japan, our children, we give them Americanized names, help them fit in. Yeah. And it's funny because Southeast Asian, Indian, for example, they don't do that. I have many friends who have names given them their parents, like Avesh, Vinay. And Veer. Exactly. And what's remarkable, it's not like there's a great council of East Asian parents who sat down to say, no, we're going to name our kids Kevin, and Jimmy, and Eric. It's not like there's a big Indian conference where they say, no, no, we're actually going to keep the names the way there is. It just worked out that way. One of those things that make you go, oh, I'm black. <laughs> so, um, I'm clearly not black, but... As an East Asian, something that I always realize when I'm talking to a professor, and I realize that this is a privilege, um, but it's also founded on racist like generalizations, is that whenever I'm submitting late work, or I just literally don't do anything because I'm a lazy piece of shit, um, is that I can just hit them with a, oh, I'm sorry, um, I've never done this before. I'm always so on top of my my stuff, but can I please? They eat that shit up. They literally eat it up, like no questions asked. Like they just can't fathom the idea of like a Chinese person like being lazy or just not doing something or being smart. Like like every teacher and professor that I've ever had has just automatically assumed that I was a nerd and has never turned down like a request for an extension ever. You might be wondering what could that be, but there is this let me say assumption that uh, Asian American are the most successful immigrant in America right now. And there's a lot of debate around that topic. And the next clip that I'm going to play is trying to explain the diversities and the dynamism that is across that success that people speak of. Yeah, we cannot ignore that because it's mentioned from so many sources that Asian American immigrants are the most successful immigrants in America right now. Yeah, I don't know. Have any reason for doubt? Yeah, don't hesitate to to conduct your own research on that. Yeah, I don't know how relevant it is, but let me play this clip so that you get more information on it. Okay, another comment about this: the um, I think it's actually very important that we collectively problematize the concept of success. So this comment and and really this perception is really born out of um, the idea that Asian Americans have achieved like socioeconomic success, right? Um, some Asian Americans are among the highest earning class. There are a lot of Asian Americans who have received. Um, you know, higher education that have opened um, gates for them in many um, circumstances, in many sectors, um, not all though. So the so the concept of success is really the ability to be able to move up the socioeconomic ladder that is very gay kept and to be able to move up this hierarchy without fundamentally challenging the hierarchy itself. So I think we must problematize this notion of success. Um, and in, ad in addition to that, even if we are working within the framework of success within the, the socioeconomic hierarchical structure, um, it's also important for us to think about disaggregate data for Asian America. So when we really look at disaggregate data um, for things like you know um, access to education, um, access to healthcare, housing, um, income levels, et cetera, like quality of life. When we look at disaggregate data for uh, for people, for example, for immigrant populations versus refugee populations, for people from different parts of Asia, across gender lines, across um, other factors, other historical factors, um, it is it becomes very clear that within Asian America, there is a wide range. So it is true that Asian Americans collectively are among the highest earners. However, within Asian America, um, within that umbrella group, 
um, Asian America also has the largest gap between the lowest income earners and the highest. So, um, so it's both the most socioeconomically diverse group and with aggregate data, um, it tells a very different story versus looking at disaggregate data. Pretty privilege in East Asia. Believe me or not, but this is so serious here. Depending on your looks, people will treat you completely differently. If you actually fit into their beauty standard, you will be already in the top tier of how they will treat you. A great example is their tolerance towards you. If you did a mistake, they will usually say, oh, it's okay, she's pretty, so that's fine, she can make that mistake. This is literal. If you're asking for help, whether you're at school or at work, they will be more likely to help you. And they're more likely to take their time out of their day to actually help you as well. A society actually takes that way, how much pressure pressure do people actually have to deal with in their daily lives? Considering that in East Asia, many people actually get something done in their face. In Korea and even like in Japan, I have heard that it is rude to not wear makeup as a woman at work. It might sound surprising to you, but let me tell you that most of the girls at my workplace, they all wear makeup. It broke my heart when I had dinner with one of my co-workers yesterday and she told me that it has been told to her to actually wear makeup. And have you ever considered that wearing glasses is actually ugly? I haven't and I still wear my glasses if I have to, but actually in East Asia, many, many girls, they go for contact lenses instead of wearing glasses. Simply because it is believed that glasses don't look good. What the hell? Who actually came up with that thought? And it's not just about how your face looks, but also your body. I'm actually more on the curvier side because I grew up in Europe and here I'm considered as fat and chubby. If you actually see how the girls here are counting the calories and counting their kilograms or pounds, it is insane. And all of that pressure will also influence how your age is perceived. After 25, you are already considered as old in a society. Isn't that so stressful? The first thing that was asked to me when I arrived here at my workplace in Korea, it was, how old are you? I would ask back, they would actually not be ready to tell me how old they are. It's totally fine because I genuinely don't care. Because if you're working with me, you're working with me, not by age, because we're all equal, aren't we? But this mindset is very Western. Here in Korea, here in East Asia, it works differently. Your age, your status, your looks, your background, your ethnicity, your nationality, your XYZ, anything will accumulate to the price tag that will stick to your head of how people will value you and they will treat you then accordingly what do you guys think about such mindset and how would you change it and is it different in your country maybe it's just me anyways um so i grew up in northern virginia specifically springfield i grew up all over northern virginia but springfield most of my life right and i don't know if you know about springfield but springfield is comprised majority well there's west springfield which is like rich people we'll talk about that after um but the springfield that i grew up like lower income and it's made up a lot of like immigrant families a lot of latin american african and asian right and the neighborhoods that i grew up specifically there's a lot of vietnamese filipino and pakistani immigrant families right and that's who i really grew up most going to like school with right so along with those groups also like ghanians somalis and ethiopians we all went to like the same kind of elementary schools right when we mixed in with like the other like schools to for like middle school and high school that's when you realize just how i didn't know that there was that much beef between asians right and it kind of translated into beef with us and i was like whoa again i don't want to overstep i just want to talk about my own experience but like usually you would see a lot of like east asian students right and i don't want to single out like a single ethnicity between them i'm just going to say east asian students the way that they were they would call like latinos filipinos as an insult I remember there was this one boy who he was like oh like you're really tan and i was like bitch we are the same color and he was like oh but it's different it doesn't matter if our parents are from different continents me and you are the same color ib and ap classes clearly don't make people smarter that's all i'm gonna say about that and i would hear comments about vietnamese people and filipinos and pakistanis hanging out with the mexicans there's no mexicans in northern virginia like barely any like are you even trying to get the ethnicity correct and also something that I know would piss off like the Pakistani students is like East Asians would call them Indians. And I was like, there's like three Indians in our entire school. And this whole separation of East Asians and Southeast Asians, it's institutional too, because in elementary school and like Esau or whatever, like the kids who spoke Japanese, Korean and Mandarin, they would be put in one Esau class, right? I'm not kidding you when I tell you they would put the Vietnamese and Filipino kids in the Spanish speaking kids Esau classes. We would literally be looking at each other like, we didn't understand each other. Filipino kids, we could understand them, kind of. Like, not really, but like, more or less. When we had to talk to the Vietnamese kids, because they would make us talk to each other, we literally didn't know. They would like try and force us to speak English. It would literally be like, hola, xin chao. 
That's why when I see discourse like that video, I'm just like, oh my god, I was a witness to this when I was watching Playhouse Disney. I don't know if it was yours, but that was my experience growing up. I really don't get what is so hard to understand about East Asian Americans having privilege over Southeast Asian Americans. And not that this is equivalent at all, but it's the creators who so easily understand how Asian Americans can be complicit in anti-blackness that are struggling to understand how East Asian Americans can be complicit in excluding Southeast Asian Americans. Like, obviously, at that point, you understand something about how racial hierarchy functions, so why can't you get to the point where you understand how you can be complicit in enforcing a racial hierarchy within your own racial category? Like, nobody's saying that East Asian Americans don't experience racism and don't receive hate and don't struggle from systemic inequalities. But there is privilege that comes from colorism and there is privilege that comes from being centered in discourse. I think ignoring and gaslighting Southeast Asian creators is the real tool of white supremacy happening If you're East Asian, I want to remind you that it's not our place to decide whether East Asian privilege is a thing or not. We should be listening to what non-East Asians are saying and consider how the difference in the reception and perception of East Asians can affect our experiences, which also doesn't negate the racism and discrimination we faced. But privilege isn't necessarily about having the power to oppress or having supremacy in society. It can be about the prejudice we don't to this to extent, I might say that you are amazing. Thank you so much for supporting my content smash that like button subscribe to the channel don't forget to leave your thoughts kindly i appreciate your support goodbye for now